my phone reminds me to, or suggests to me that I should reboot the phone. Uh, and the reason for that is because over the course of a week, you know, the, the, the memory gets cluttered up with cookies and uh, apps and all sorts of things that, that aren't necessary to be run there. And then, when I, and then once it's cleared up, the whole thing runs more efficiently, the battery's more important there and all that. I thought, I thought that that was a great metaphor for what 2018 is for the city of St. Paul. So it's somewhat of a reboot here. And for, for two reasons I say that. One is that we're, we're kind of having a shift in paradigm after this rapid growth where we, for 10 years, were the most uh, fastest growing city in the state of Washington, to where now uh, we're shifting more into a maintenance mode, so we're kind of having to shift the paradigms now we look at things. And then secondly is the fact that we have a council that's uh, of the seven members where we have five new members, so they've been here one year or less. And by virtue of that, they, they don't have the benefit of leaning on, or some of the newer members leaning on the more senior members to take responsibility for the decisions that are being made. And, um, and they, they certainly don't want to appear to be, or nor do they want to be, uh, rubber stamping decisions. And so on all issues, uh, I really have a great deal of respect that they, they dive into great detail on all the issues to really want to understand those. And, and I say, just kind of like when you reboot the phone, I guess what uh, has sometimes been been uh, unpleasant or, or a, a good experience for me is I find, you know, the old guys like me have been around for a decade or more. Uh, there's issues or policies I think I, I understand and remember quite clearly, and then a new council member reads that document I haven't read for five years and says, hey, I don't think the way you're applying the policy is quite where you thought it was, and it becomes clear to me that even though those of us that have been around for a while uh, have a little rust and cobwebs on things, so kind of like reading the phone, it's good to get a refresh and sort of reinvigorate things. So it's a good balance between having some that have the institutional memory and not. Uh, the, this year, also for, that, um, for the reason that this council has not been, uh, had the benefit of, uh, or, or on May 5th, or May 4th, we're going to have a day where the, this council, this new group together, is going to first have an opportunity to start looking at uh, all the uh, goals and objectives that they've inherited from the past council, and also uh, dive into, in the next couple of months, a uh, buy-in and budget process. And for that reason, I'm going to do a bit of a different pivot this year. I'm not going to get into strategic things and other budgeting things or, or forecasting to presume to sort of assume where the council is going to land on that. Instead, I'll go uh, department by department, kind of looking at this is a year where we got a lot going on, but I'm going to focus on the things that I think strategically still are, are things the council will embrace and uh, goals that they have in terms of just uh, protecting quality of life issues for the citizens, uh, embracing sustainability economically and, and otherwise in the city. And, and also uh, getting the whole city and our infrastructure into a forward, forward stance of a proactive sort of uh, governance. So with that, uh, real quickly, just to, to note that um, I was relieved that Councilmember Jeans and Councilmember Holloway were re-elected and able to come back to the council. They've been on the council for about a decade, so their institutional experience is very much valued, uh, and, and the citizens benefit from that. The, our two, next two most senior members now are council members Ross and Sunwall, who came on in April and May of last year, and so they're, they're real some longtime veterans now. <laughs> and they were joined by uh, in, in September, no, uh, September, November, and January by respectively by Jim Mayhew, Matt Lassie, and Peggy Shepherd. Uh, like I said, a great hardworking team that uh, I'm very honored to work with. Uh, so now shifting to departments in terms of goals, one of the other phenomenon that often happens in rapid, rapid growing organizations is, you know, we've been just sort of running as fast as we can to keep up with the growth and constantly adjusting and reorganizing city governance to keep up with that growth. And much of that focus has been on sort of the outward focused departments, the police and the fire and the parks and the, the stuff that has a high touch with citizens and what will generate the most mistakes. But like many organizations, uh, it's come, become clear to us in the last several months that there's uh, some, some maybe vulnerabilities and weaknesses because we haven't been attending to, kind of to the back office, to the finance and administration aspect of the business in terms of what makes the, the wheels turn and keep things going every day. So a couple shifts in that regard for the finance department is one, uh, many of you know Nicholas Lee moved on to the King County uh, Library System as their finance director recently. I'm uh, very pleased that Rob Wharton was able to step back in and help us out or came back from retirement uh, to help us through a difficult transition. But we're really excited to bring Robert Hammond on board. Robert, um, he'll be joining us on May 7th. He comes with a lot of background and kind of going into situations where they've had a lot of difficult, uh, what I would characterize as dumpster fires in different organizations, kind of a turnaround specialist. I think he's excited that any issues we have are more like a small wastebasket fire. Um, but uh, we're excited to have him come in and kind of look at those issues, put a lot of attention with the council there. Uh, we're up very much on the same page with the council. Uh, so, and this, this is going to be a director level position for the first time in the city's history. Again, a kind of reorganization where he'll have more, more folks under his, uh, he'll be responsible for and able to have more control over a lot of those operation and internal controls. 
So we did have, uh, like an example, last year I was rolling out one of the strategic initiatives that we wanted to move to a, a priority-based budgeting uh, process. But again, because of the dynamics where we had to sort of pull back and say, look, we got to reset, get this council on board and really reset the foundation. We delayed that uh, priority-based budgeting. We'll have to go back and revisit and see if the current council really wants to buy into that sort of approach. So we'll, we'll, we'll revisit that. We did get a clean audit from the state uh, this year. Uh, no management letters or findings or whatnot. Uh, yet, with that said, uh, it still doesn't mean that we don't want to give great attention. We went outside, well, outside and hired a, um, an outside consultant, Clark and Newber, that's done kind of a, a forensic examination of all our systems and controls and operations. They're ready to come back with it. They're working now with the staff for an action report, and once that's together, we'll bring that out to the council and the public for, for review and then start making those strategic changes to, again, raise the bar in that department as we have in the other departments. In, uh, in one, one initiative, where, meanwhile, uh, this was an initiative led by Councilmember Sunwall to make uh, a lot of what, what we do in decisions made more accessible, to invite the community more into the process and the conversations that we do. We now have a video stream. Uh, this is taking advantage of new technologies, too. The IT staff did a great job setting this up where all our council members are video streamed. You can watch them live. And of course, then anybody can go back and watch those council members uh, on our YouTube site at any time they want to. Another initiative by last year I was talking about that, like Ken just said, a roll out a new website. You know, we thought our website was kind of cool and new, and we said, you know, rolled it out about eight, ten years ago, but of course it's been a little stale and stodgy. And we now have a fresh one that was implemented in, in uh, just it's December of this last year, about four months ago. And again, to all the reasons that Ken said, it's just far more intuitive, more accessible, uh, a much cleaner, uh, better environment. It is, uh, it does support a mobile application, but that's the next step that Joan will be working on is to actually create a mobile app that supports that as well to again have better access to all that information or interaction for citizens. For the fire department, uh, with, the, with the addition of Teresa Tozier as a, that firefighter uh, that we added uh, a couple years year or so ago, that really helped, I think, for those of you that heard my presentation then, that, that one addition is what really helped be able to fill out every crew or, or, or um, shift with three firefighters on staff. So rather than, than Chief Carrera spending all this time trying to constantly rejuggle shifts and plug shifts and move personnel around, he can fo focus now on again raising the bar more in the fire department. So some of his initiatives is finishing the five-year strategic plan for that department, uh, coming out with a new comprehensive standards coverage. And then one of the more exciting things too is they're in the final evaluation stage with the uh, Center for Public Safety and Excellence to be, uh, to be accredited, uh, something that not many fire departments achieve. And the police department, uh, I think it's hard to underestimate for most folks how difficult it has been with the intense scrutiny that police departments have received across the country. The unintended side effect has been that, uh, because the perception is you could be in that career and one incident could just end your career, uh, depending on how that's perceived. And so it's, it's, been, it's really dissuaded a lot of adults and young adults from, from considering this very honorable profession of which the vast majority of, of officers conduct themselves with great integrity. But it's a profession that fewer people are considering uh, to go into. And so the competition for getting good, solid officers and recruiting officers has become very fierce. But a huge uh, coup to uh, Chief, <clears throat> Chief Phipps in that uh, for the first time in about four years now, we're fully staffed. And that will, of course, um, serve both communities well. We're also finally getting the two new detectives on board. And the big deal with that is we can get more into specialization. Uh, they plan to move to more, more of the uh, patrol investigations, kind of a model of operations where every officer is a chief cook and, and bottle washer, uh, where they can do patrols when, they're, when they've got a case and they've got to do the investigations, right? but of course they can pass that off to the detectives so they can continue to um, focus on patrols. It'll, we, we think, improve response times, uh, re improve the integrity of investigations or, or reports that would go to a prosecutor for more successful prosecutions and, and better follow-up and so forth. Just put the whole, again, that department in terms of its operations in a more practice stance that will benefit, again, in the entire profile. And of course, we'll be, uh, I'm pleased to hear that the mayor of North Bend is very pleased with the contracts, as we'll be now re renegotiating that. <laughs> uh, now, shifting to the community development department, actually, in most places, that's called the community and economic development department, because that department, which was formerly our planning department, we merged our building department into that too a couple years ago. Uh, really has two two components or focuses in that, of which it's always kind of struggling in terms of a quality of life issue to have a balance. One is economic development, and, and the other is community development. Economic development is about trying to, as Ken was saying, how do you struggle as a community to figure out the appropriate balance in terms of where your revenues are coming from? Um, 
If, if we don't, for example, in Suquamish, well, I mean, half of our tax base, unlike North Bend, where 70% of theirs is getting from commercial and retail activity, we're getting half of ours from, from residential activity. So it's a heavy burden on property tax, and we need to diversify that more. And if we ignore that, then the quality of life becomes threatened if the cost of providing services and quality services continues to go up and makes uh, life more difficult for folks. So if we can balance that, again, by having it subsidized by more commercial development, that's what we want to look for there. But of course, then, even in that, we want to make sure to, to find those character issues to, to retain the character of the community. And uh, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to start out with projects kind of focused on economic development, and then I'll pivot to ones that are more focused on community. Planning Commission has the benefit of focusing mostly on community development. That's protecting the aesthetic and the quality of the, the community. The council, of course, has to wrestle with all the budget issues on top of that. So last year I showed you this slide um, of the business part, and you can see just other than a couple lots here, there was just the, the retail lots at the front that were remaining. And we all knew the Safeway and Bartels and the hotel. This is one part of a big strategic, again, for that economic diversity coming in. And pleased to see that now that you can see the QOC and Bartels is in and the construction of the hotel is now well underway. Here was the photo I showed you at last year's presentation of the Safeway in spring of 2017. Here's the grand opening in August of 2017. Not the grand opening, but the opening. And then Bartels at last year, and of course that was the opening in July of 2017. And the Starbucks and Mod Pizza, which have been, uh, Mod Pizza has particularly been popular. Uh, here's just a refresh on the hotel. I don't want to spend too much time on this. Just a refresh real quick. It's a 99 room hotel, projected to bring in about uh, $300,000 annually to the city. It's uh, also, the hotel is located here on the site with another uh, adjacent building, about 8,300 square feet downstairs, a retail and restaurant, 8,300 square feet upstairs of office space. And, and, uh, here was the renderings I showed last year, and now, of course, you can see here's the, the secondary building wet ready to come out of the ground with the retail office space restaurant and the hotel just beyond. Here's the renderings from last year, and of course, the hotel now is going to use now. It's at its full, full height. And now, the one I think a lot of people have been anticipating for some time that's quite exciting. This was uh, dropped into the city offices on April 2nd. This is the application on the Salish Lodge. This is a project that was actually. Uh, entitled, legally entitled to move forward over 14 years ago. Actually, I was still on the council at that time. And now finally, the Muckleshoot we'll Tribe is coming forward with this project. Uh, this is this is kind of the layout of the proposed um, site. The shaded area up above is where there are about 150 units of residential housing is uh, proposed to go. That's going to be a later phase. They're not submitting that at this time. They're, they're only basically fo focusing on the hotel. Uh, in, they, they consider this a very special site themselves, too. The city requires that about 28% of the site be reserved in open space. They've actually pushed that up to 58%. They want this to be a very wooded uh, kind of nature experience for their guests when they come to this. Uh, I liken it to kind of some Katie when you drive through there. You're sort of driving through narrow forested roads with a, kind of a small scale street lighting and so forth. They're looking to face the hotel so as to establish its market presence in the stages. The first phase would be over here. The um, the, uh, about a 93-room hotel in the center right here with a, about a 26,000, 27,000 square foot event space and restaurants and eating facilities. Uh, to, to put that kind of square footage in perspective, it's about the size of the IG, IGA building, including the liner shops or the uh, exhibition hall and storage facility over at the Northwest Railway Museum, so a fairly large facility. Uh, the second phase will, will be the central facility with this circle arc you see it, uh, the pool looking south toward the falls with a spa in there as well. And then the third phase, another uh, about 89, 90 rooms of hotel here with another 30 of um, managed residential units. There's a look kind of hovering high up above the Topo Roundabout. I do want to note before I forget that this is going to be a quasi-judicial process, so please don't pester the council members because they're sort of like judges on a jury that can't uh, speak about the same with planning commission members because this will be going to them soon too for review. Uh, the Malkoshoots, again, this is a very special site for them. They, they share a common heritage with the Snoqualmie tribe, and so they very much want to celebrate not only in the architecture of the building itself, but in some murals that the, the Northwest Indian culture and heritage. This is a drive up to the main uh, lobby to the far right of the first phase. You see the, the round section here beyond is the spa and pool area, the second phase, and this is part of the first phase. Here's the spa and pool area just beyond looking back northward. Here's a view from the swimming pool, looking 
uh, southward toward the Snohomie Falls, and again, here's where you get a sense of where they want to create that sense that you're in a forest uh, with the fir trees, and actually carry that right into the pool. If, if the architect can get away with it, this is what he wants to do, I have to have those sort of trees going right through the swimming pool. <laughs> this is the uh, events center off to the far left of the project in the first phase, again, kind of picking up on the Northwest Indian cultural motif. And of course, this will go through extensive environmental review analysis, looking at traffic, economic impacts, fiscal analysis. Uh, we're seeing very, very positive uh, fiscal financial benefits for the city and the community for this project, uh, despite House Bill 1287 that uh, allows pro uh, tribes to apply for property tax exemptions off of reservations. We appealed that in the courts. We won a Superior Court, but lost in the Supreme Court. But while that appeal was going on, we, we negotiated Plan B with the muckle shoots that will benefit, benefit us equally uh, as if we had prevailed. And so we'll, we'll still be in pretty good shape economically. We'll look at utility impacts, view shed analysis. In fact, they, they flew drones 50 and 100 feet from views from the bridge and from the viewing platform down by the falls. And, and only one instance could, have, could one of the drones be seen at 50 feet, but the, that was uh, in a location that was well below where the hotel, you would not be able to see the hotel from any of that area down below. Uh, also, there'll be cultural, uh, cultural assessments have already been done, 181 shovel, uh, shoveling in the ground looking for any um, uh, evidence of, of past, you know, Indian cultural history and there'll be archaeological oversight. Of course, again, this is, this is a project advanced by the Muggle Shoot, so they have a, a great deal invested in, in making sure it's uh, done in a very tasteful way. On the mill site, uh, I hope many of you were around 11 months ago when uh, Tom Srove gave his presentation, and I don't have, we really have no updates or new details since that time. I think you can get some information on their Snohomie Mill no Venture site on the initial presentation or concepts. Um, we do anticipate in the next three or four months that will be submitted, similar to the sales one, for, for staff review, and then that should go forward to the Planning Commission and the Council, but at this time there's no updates. And another exciting one that, due to time I had to pull out last year, but I should be moving forward soon, is uh, Mike and, and Ryan Seal that uh, owns the Gellows are busted at the seams, and it's really to them. They love being in Snoqualmie, but it's an issue for them where either they have to move out of the city and find a bigger facility or build one here. They're very excited about investing in downtown Snoqualmie. This is a building uh, that they, they uh, want to place at the corner, what we call the King Street lot at the corner of Railroad and King, right next to the bowling alley, uh, right behind, in front of Riverview, uh, I'm sorry, the Sandy Cove Park. Uh, they wanted it to feel like a, a structure that's been there for 100 years or something like more like an old cannery. That's a front view. This is a view from the bowling alley looking back southward toward the facility. We're even, we're even exploring with them some sort of partnership of building a facility that would, uh, where you could do events that would be on the bank overlooking the Sandy Cove Park and the river just beyond the parking lot. Here's a view from the park looking back up the hill toward the, the rear of the building. And then this is the first floor plan that shows a large production area with bar barrel storage areas, wine tasting rooms, dining. Uh, for, for wine, wine production and so forth. And then upstairs is a, a, essentially a boutique hotel of about a dozen rooms that could handle uh, mostly a kind of a niche market for a lot of bridal parties that would come in and have weddings and so forth. And I've seen a concept like this down by Lake Tahoe and it was really an extraordinary uh, experience operation. And now shifting or pivoting to more of the community development piece of uh, our community development department. Uh, we are, this, this could take an hour alone on this complex project. This is a 20-year plan for comprehensive river, uh, trails kind of connecting all these components and the revitalization of downtown and the development of the mill site with the Salish uh, to connect all these pieces with trails and a pedestrian bridge eventually. The first phase is uh, well underway in, in terms of design. We've already got some monies to start put, actually putting some infrastructure in the ground here in the coming year, so stay tuned on that one. And then to Ken's point on workforce housing, I agree, Jonas had asked a great question. I think affordable housing is one of the greatest threats because uh, particularly that, S or that SR18 corridor goes hand in hand with that because we increasingly cannot have people that support all of the business activity in this valley working in service sector jobs are not paid enough wages to live here. And, uh, and school districts and, and a lot of other organizations or even cities are having harder and harder times retaining employees. Uh, for that reason. So we're excited that one of the last components of required affordable housing for Snoqualmie Ridge Phase 2 is coming forward. All the last legal hurdles were, um, are now done and this project is ready to proceed on 191 units of housing in a, uh, that's, I'm sorry, I should have noted again, that's located down here. The hospital is on this parcel just to the south of it out by the I-90 SRE interchange. This is 191 units of affordable housing at 60% or less of adjusted median income for King County. 
And you saw this last year, so I'm going to blast through it pretty quickly. Or as many of you saw it last year anyway. So just sight, sight line of it, uh, analysis, and here's what some of the units look like. This is, this is rental apartment product. And then a very exciting product for the school board, the school district, that after about a, over a decade of, of failed attempts to try and get a bond passed, we finally got a bond passed, and outside high school is under a massive uh, reconstruction, uh, which is consuming a lot of time, of course, from our city staff as well, but uh, we're excited to support that project. As far as I know, Carolyn is on time and ready to open in 2019, but uh, it's uh, quite exciting watching that coming out of the ground. Uh, to, the gentleman that actually asked the question about the property over in downtown North Bend, this has been kind of our chronic eyesore that we've been for years trying to figure out how do we get this old honey farm off of 3D43 developed. I can assure you the neighbors behind it were not happy at all. Um, and we've had we've had proposals that have come in, look like redevelopment, and then it falls apart. But I can, uh, I'm happy to report that we now have a, a project moving forward that I think people will be quite excited about. I went out and photographed it yesterday. This is what the honey farm now looks like. Okay, you can applaud them. And you know, I think you'll also be excited to know you're going to hear about a big, exciting fundraising campaign come out of which they're well underway and successful. If you were at the breakfast yesterday, Encompass is the one that purchased the property. And we're excited to take this very valuable community partner that we've always supported to now have them with another campus in our city of Snoqualmie. They're looking, this will provide them an opportunity to increase by at least 30% the number of families and children that they can serve with this new campus here. Uh, so stay tuned. And yeah. uh, another really exciting project that's kind of connected to this, because of course a lot of those kids with special needs grow up and become adults, and what becomes of them? We know of several families that have kids with like Down syndrome, for example, and a lot of those. And, and they understand that many of those kids are living with their parents most of their lives. But the problem is, at some point, that parent gets very old and maybe needs to go to the senior center, and they're not capable of caring for that child anymore. For it. So it's a bit of a panic for them. So this is an organization called Leo, or Life Enrichment Options, where they provide housing with a, 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 a live-in caretaker to attend to the, those uh, adults with disabilities. And they purchased a house just a few blocks from where Encompass will have their campus. They've torn that house down and are in the process of building this new home that'll have uh, enough to, for, for six families or six in, uh, individuals along with it, in addition to the caretaker. So we're excited to support that as a community partner as well. Uh, I'm going to shift now to the Public Works and Parks Department because this is part of our pivot or paradigm shift from kind of high growth to now getting into high maintenance in terms of old historical infrastructure. I was reminded that a few years back, we have a bunch of junk piled under our kitchen sink. Please don't ever look under it. Um, but we didn't realize that there's the hose feed in the faucet that has small leak in it. This isn't my sink, actually. Never got to look that bad. But, um, you know, by the time we discovered it, it would have done some damage to the floor of the cabinet. I went down to the store for 20 bucks, bought a new line, and installed it myself, fixed the problem. But it occurred to me, if I, if I neglected that, you could see eventually where the floor of the cabinet would probably rot out. And in order to fix the cabinet, I might eventually have to tear out the countertop, pull the whole thing out. So this cost quickly goes from 20 bucks to 200 bucks to $2,000, or if you let it go long enough, it's going to get into the framing. And frankly, you shouldn't think of any uh, city, all of your city infrastructure any different than that. If you're, this is what I mean when I say proactive versus reactive. When you're in a reactive mode, you're just chasing around problems like this that you've neglected. You're, Mark Silver, there's a big grin on his face going, oh yeah. Uh, <laughs> Public Works Director for North Bend. Uh, sorry, I didn't get the laser tag in. <laughs> the, uh, you're, you're, you're fixing this stuff at four or five times the cost than, than if you're in, in, a, in a regular, good, uh, healthy maintenance mode. And uh, as Ben Franklin says, it's summed up with the term, ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. So you pay, a, pay an ounce now or you're going to pay a pound later. So in that regard, the council a few years back allocated $300,000 a year to go to parks, but we have 39 parks to take care of, and if we're just going to ignore those and suddenly have to address all of them at once, it would be overwhelming, so we just strategically are going after a few of those every year. Uh, Raven Park was one that was just redone. Here's kind of the equipment getting a little old and splintery and whatnot. Here was the upgrade there. Uh, not only replacing some old equipment, but also doing upgrades where it reduces maintenance time for staff and we don't have to bark in these soft surfaces. Um, so it just makes those more efficient too. Here was Ironwood. Yep, that's the before and after. Uh, Koinonia Park is one of the next big ones we're after. It's about a half acre park. We have to, I can't disagree with the residents that most of them have been trying to figure out what exactly is this. <laughs> so it's a very small play structure. And you'll see on this next map, there's the circular area. It's the increased tenfold the amount of play area. 
And the lawn up here is a hill right now with poor drainage, and we'll be flattening that to just make that park, uh, again, not only better maintained, but it hugely. And we'll get some grants uh, from uh, CDBG grants, federal grants, to help with that project. We had a big, hit one of those BHAGs or big, hairy, audacious goals a few years back when a group of uh, citizens, or actually it was the kids that kind of led the effort, that said, gosh darn it, Snoqualmie needs a skate park. And, um, it, but this is what, about a $400,000. $450,000 price tag for this item, and we kind of took a shot at it. Uh, Mark Mullet, Senator Mark Mullet, we were very pleased, secured about a $175,000 state grant for this, and the council took a big risk to, to accept the grant without knowing exactly how we were going to match or find the rest of the funding. So it was a great relief to me when I got a phone call from uh, Kathy Lambert from the county one day saying, hey, I got some money for a park, what do you need? And bingo, so she was our big hero there. So we're going to call this the Mulbird for the Lambert Park, you know, from Mark, Mark Mullet and Kathy Lambert. Uh, to help, help secure the big funding. And then we had generosity from some private, like the YMCA Square One, RH2, that have been contributing to this project. Taxpayers are going to have to put about a whopping $8,500 into this, so we're pleased to deliver that. Um, so that's the skate park there. Uh, these are often can be sort of an attractive for some not so good activities. Uh, so we wanted a highly visible location. This is Borden, that's the entrance road to the YMCA. And Red Street down below is right below the basketball court. The soccer field's out here. So this will be a great addition that we're very excited about for the community. I can assure you all those skateboard kids are pretty excited too. Uh, this is our next big, very audacious goal. Uh, Larry White, I know he's here. There's Larry back there. Uh, Larry's sort of taking my breath away because he's grabbed this one by the bullhorns running ahead. This is even a bigger lift. This is about a, almost a, a million dollar project. But it's very exciting. This is kind of a new um, a sort of a realization that Cities across the country have really uh, failed a lot of families with special needs kids. And the trend is moving toward playgrounds that are all inclusive, that kids uh, of all needs and, and abilities can access those playgrounds. And this will be a, a, a profound remake and expansion of the Centennial Fields playground uh, down, down below. We're going to put in for a $500,000 uh, uh, state grant. And uh, I'll just put this on Kathy's radar too to be maybe a hero for some of that too. I already got a seventy-five thousand dollar grant for county, but uh, but Larry rolled up his sleeve and even used his birthday party down to Segellos to roll out a fundraiser. And Larry, how much did you raise from the fundraiser so far? Twenty-seven thousand. <laughs> yeah. Seven. Uh, it was really cool. This last week, the Ridge Residential Owners Association just put out a, their newsletter. It's calling it the 20th Ridge Retrospective on the 20th year, kind of a look back at the Ridge. And this was a great picture that just caught my eye, uh, showing up there our, our really forward-looking, state-of-the-art sewer treatment plant being built down there, just across the, the river on the bridge uh, by the sailors. And uh, I, I've loved bragging about this, uh, this infrastructure for years, where uh, by state-of-the-art, I mean it, it's got oxidation ditches where a bunch of bugs chew up all the material. It goes into the clarifiers where all the solids set are cells separated. The water goes into sand filters and then into UV, and it's so clean when it comes out, it's pumped up to the lake right out here, and then we use that to irrigate all of the, uh, uh, the, the parks and the golf course and so forth. Few communities can kind of brag that they have that fourth utility of a purple pipe system for all that reclaimed water. Uh, the, but what it also occurred to me was that when this plant was first built, uh, I had sitting on my, about 1990, circa 96, 97, the, uh, the desktop that was sitting on my desk at home was a 486 pre-Pentium computer with about a 250 meg hard drive and about a, a screaming fast 8 megabytes of RAM. Uh, put that perspective, this presentation here uh, was going take up about 60% of the hard drive on that computer. And I know that might say more about my presentations than about the computer. But um, suffice it to say, and, and the, 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 the phone in my pocket is about 128 times more storage on this than what that desktop computer had. So it just sort of illustrates how far the technologies have changed. And this is a very high-tech facility. It's really amazing technology. I never thought as mayor I'd get excited about sewer stuff, but it's, it's amazing infrastructure and technology. There's about a half a million dollars of uh, hardware and software systems that go into running this plant. And from that, and even uh, on, uh, remotely, our guys can access pumps and valves all over the city. Uh, from that, but we need to uh, do, we're doing about a half million dollar investment in upgrading all that. And again, this goes into that proactive maintenance cycle where we don't wait for everything to start to fail. I know even for my house, uh, this last year my furnace failed, my appliances are starting to go, uh, my roof needs to be replaced, the carpet shot after four kids trashed it. Uh, so when you think of that, some of the motors and like the clarifiers have been running 24-7 for over 21 years or so, 
it's sort of logical that even though this new, bright, shiny, state-of-the-art plant, it's very illustrative of the fact that even now this new infrastructure is coming up and needing a lot of attention. So we're, we're um, doing some very significant investments in this. This is the current plant, and just beyond you see a new facility being built here. The first phase is about four and a half million dollars. It'll be a total fifty million dollar project. This is a new, by cutting the cost dramatically of how we treat the biosolids that come out of the facility, it's going to be an aerobic digester that will make this a very high quality fertilizer that'll be shipped out to farms in eastern Washington. Right now, it's going to the landfill at greater cost. Um, you know, kind of have to run through these quickly. Uh, this is a, a 1.5 megawatt gener uh, generator gen set that we put in here that can light up not only the whole public works facility but also the public works building. It's got a 12,000 gallon uh, f fuel tank next to it that can keep that running for a full seven days if the power went out recently. And the importance of that, the comfort of that is that, as I said, that the, the biodigesters run on billions of bugs that eat and digest that stuff up. If that shuts down for long enough and those bugs start to die off, it can take up to four months or six months to replenish that, that, uh, those bugs that eat up the system. So at, at a significant cost, so this is a very proactive sort of uh, safety mechanism. So again, whether it's the hardware, software, all this, just better efficiencies, better security. We're a little so homey, but there's countries and other agencies trying to break into and hijack systems like this, so even just having better security. This is another ingenious solution that I just uh, love that illustrates kind of a twofold solution. This is called a backwash tank. Um, we pump water in several wells, uh, 700 foot deep wells that goes into a, a facility where, where it's filtered. But a couple times a day we have to filter the, or clean the filters by backwashing them with potable water. That potable water takes a lot of the minerals and elements and arsenic and other things that are filtered out of the water and we can't throw it in the river. So it has to go into the sewer uh, wastewater treatment plant to the tune of sometimes 300,000 gallons a day in a 4.2 million gallon system or a, a system that takes about 4.2 4 4 million gallons a day. That represents about 5 or 6% of its capacity. So if I was to increase a $300 million plant by that much, I'd be, I'd be spending another uh, 10 to $20 million to increase plant capacity to treat that kind of affluent. But what we've done is built this, this large 180,000-gallon uh, uh, 180, backwash tank where the, the water that's used to clean the filters goes into the bash, backwash tank we filter out or let the sediments and other uh, impurities settle out of it, and we can use that water back into the, into the backwash systems again. So it has a twofold huge virtuous benefit. One is we, um, we reduce the need to constantly be pulling 180 or 300,000 gallons of potable water out of the system, and it increases capacity to serve another 350 homes with water without throwing money into building or drilling new wells or building new well state systems. And then it saves a huge amount of money by increasing capacity in the wastewater treatment facility by keeping that affluent from going into the wastewater treatment facility. So it's always cool when our guys or engineers are coming up with these ingenious solutions. And again, this is not Dan Marcin and all his team. Uh, and, and you've heard me in the past say how we're trying to aggressively, uh, much of the downtown infrastructure, all the streets and uh, utilities are kind of, they, they've been neglected for decades and a lot of it's on the verge of failure. And we have sewer pipes and water lines and whatnot underground that, are, are, if they fail, we're into triage and reactive modes where we're digging up. And sometimes, it, over time, if it's on a weekend or evening, at considerable cost. So we want to get in and just rebuild this infrastructure so it's good for the next 50 years or more and, um, and save considerable cost for the residents overall. And so this is one more, one more street that we got done this last year down on Northern Street. And uh, another project that kind of reared its head that we didn't anticipate was one of our, our best water sources that doesn't need to be filtered and clean. It's the great, great fresh spring water, one of our greatest sources, uh, the Canyon Springs down along uh, the end of the, the North Road, the Running Road. Uh, out about Ernie's, Ernie's Grove, it's about a mile out to the wellhead. Um, and we've we just recently had some major slides in that area. Um, this, these, these pipes that you see right here were old stove pipes that came out of the ground. That was a system that, that is actually wood, wood pipe wrapped in wire that was in use until I, about the time I graduated from high school. That maybe since says something about how old I am. Um, and so that, that's what you see that popped out of the ground was an old abandoned system that was abandoned in the 1980s. And, but what concerns us is a little more than about six feet beyond this bank here is the new line that was put in in 1980. And so this is a, a very vulnerable to uh, exposure there. So we have to buy about a million dollar fix we're getting real quick to lay some mesh on this and secure this hill. But we may be looking at some more expensive fixes where we're maybe uh, drilling an underwater, about a mile long underwater long, long a line going from the wellhead directly under this to mitigate future landslide risks along this whole corridor. So again, it's one of these 
not only anticipating doing maintenance, but anticipate or you have unanticipated liabilities that might rear their head and uh, face this as well. So another, some of the other projects that we're looking to tackle in the, in the next couple of years, two, three years, is um, again, Railroad Place, Newton Fur, and a lot of the Delta streets. I say Delta because it's like Gamma, Beta, and so forth, over by the high school. Uh, one of the other cool projects that we just completed uh, was service meter replacements in historic downtown. All of our meters on Snoqualmie Ridge are read by antennas. We don't have guys going out manually looking at reading readers that sent information sent to an antenna, and that goes back down to the yard. We've now got those employed all over historical downtown, so again, now the whole town is in kind of that uniform, uh, more efficient system where we're saving tremendous staff time, not going out reading meters. The last piece to implement with that is putting the antennas in. Uh, that's just yet to be done. So all in all, and, and, and again, there's dozens of other projects. These were just some highlights. Where it's going to be about a $57 million investment over the next several years. And there's been some, uh, a lot of focus in community conversations in the past year or so about the number, about the million. Now, how can we be spending $57 million or you know, two or three bonds, 23 or 32 or $50 million for a city of our size? Um, it's important to make sure we're not compared to cities that have separate utility districts. We're, we're an all-service community because we're kind of an island. We're an island out here in the urban area, or rural area. But the most, there's two most important things for residents to focus on in terms of having some assurance about what the council's been doing here strategically in terms of these costs. And the one is, is there an outside agency affirming that that our risks, we're managing our risks, and that uh, and, and that there's confidence then. And where you can find confidence then is in our bond rating. When we go out to do municipal bonds. We've been in, in steadily increasing in that bond rating. For now, we're a double A minus. We hope to even go to a double A soon. Um, and that bond rating should give you know assurances that that those those investors that are buying those bonds are saying, hey, we've reviewed how you're doing all this, and it looks like you're taking reasonable uh, risk or low risks in terms of how you're structuring this and taking care of it. And then the second and one of the most important things is. What's it cost in residents at the end of the day? Because wrapped into, we've done two three-year successive utility rate increases over six years, or there's the first three years, and the council pulled the trigger on the next three years for 17, 18, and 19. And, um, but even as we're tracking those increases over the years, other communities are facing the same dilemma. So where it puts the palm is we pretty much have been consistently staying in the middle of the pack in terms of where our costs are compared to other cities. But if you fixate just on the price, that's only telling you half the story. The other half of the story to, to really pay attention to and where I would challenge anybody to compare us to most communities around the, the region or King County is, what does the quality in the, in the, of the infrastructure look like? What are you getting for those dollars? And so although we're in the middle of the pack, I would say if there was, if there was some other metric and I haven't seen one that measured it, we'd probably be at the top of the pack in terms of the quality infrastructure that we're delivering for that dollar. And so um, I think that's something to, to celebrate. And then lastly, uh, not too much reported interchange. Ken touched on this a little bit. Uh, last year I talked about this, this new innovative diversion diamond. There's information on our website about that in the video you can watch to make sense of this, um, this opportunity to drive in England for a while on the right along side of the road. Uh, it's a way to, to mitigate a lot of the conflicts out there. The original schedule for that was to begin the design in September, which is construction in July of 19, and in 2022. Uh, unfortunately, it's, the design has not begun. It's to, the schedule's already slipped about five or six months, because only now is, is, is WASTA confirming up the uh, contract with a contractor to do the work. And our, our um, top priority is to, when they get that contractor on board, is to work with them and see if we can't fit, uh, convince WASDA that at little to no cost we can provide access, um, de uh, designated access for Snoqualmie residents or Valley residents onto the freeway in the morning to, uh, throughout the construction period, and that would mitigate any kind of, and people wouldn't be so worried about how long this project slips if they could free up that bottle and they can and get access on it. So with that, um, I, I, I'll tell you, that I, I, not only is Snoqualmie remains vibrant and strong, but again, because a lot of these strategic big initiatives and projects are falling into place that we've been working on for over a decade, I can honestly say that probably since the heyday of the mill site, I, I can think of no time in the history of Snoqualmie where we've been in a stronger, uh, physically, or stronger position in terms of just uh, being able to, to take care of things in a high quality and, uh, and move forward. Thank you. Any questions? Monica says I have a couple minutes for questions if there's any questions. Monica? That's why I said you could take time for questions. <laughs> I really appreciate the um, efforts that you put into being environmentally friendly and all that you're doing proactively. This, this might be a this might be a better question for Andy Glandon. Uh, but I was just curious when you have, uh, I can't remember the name of that, but when you were showing that plot where that rectangle is that it's taking all of the arsenic and the different things to, that's, 
the backwash tank, what happens to all of the toxins and things and the arsenic and stuff that does settle into the, where does it settle, what happens to that land then and does it get into our water eventually? Where's Dan? Dan, is that, I think we have a facility called the decanter, there's another one I didn't have time to get into. Does that go to the, what's the name of that facility where we take a lot of the, like when we clean the roads, we can't just like dump that in the woods. When the sweepers come around and sweep up all the sand or residue off the roads, it's full of wells and other contaminants. The decanter, right? Yes. So I assume that material we could want to go into the decanter? Yes. Okay. So that's another project I didn't have time to focus on, but there's an investment in something called a decanter that would be next to that biosolids facility. Uh, where we and we don't have that kind of facility like that right now. So, so for the first time, we'll have a facility where we can put that kind of material and, tr and treat it properly before it goes out. Great question. I didn't expect a question about some of that sewer waste. Sorry. Stuff. That's, I think that's cool. Isn't sewer exciting? Yeah. <laughs> Any other questions? Yes, Dana. Can you say when the Salish expansion phase one might start? I mean, I know they have to go throughout the permitting. Yeah, I, I wouldn't hazard to predict. I mean, I, it really depends on how long the planning commission and council struggles with it. But I'm sorry, what's that, Bob? Two-year build-out. Yeah, no, she's asking when it, when it when anticipated to start, actually start the construction. In a year. So. Yeah, probably at least a year. And again, it depends on just how much. Because the planning commission and the council are going to be spending a lot of time listening to community input and concerns that they're going to want to be satisfied about traffic impacts and mitigate, you know, impacts to the community and just be assured that this is being planned in a very... Uh, a tasteful way that the impacts are being properly mitigated for. So, in this community, that typically takes at least a year, could be longer. Again, thank you all very much.